Good morning. My name is Jeff Sharp and I'm the director of the School Environment and Natural Resources. I know we have a long list of folks who have signed up for this program and welcome to the many of you who are logging in now. As you are joining us, please feel free to share with all attendees in the chat box your name and where you are joining us from. Adjust your message to send to all attendees, please. We are glad you are here. And if this is your first EPN, welcome. Uh, I'm sure we have quite a few of the uh, regulars here, so um, I'm glad you're able to sort of join us and make time for this day, uh, this event in your calendar. For those of who are wondering, this event is set up so that everyone will be kept on mute during the program and your camera's not on. Don't worry. Before we move into today's program, on behalf of Ohio State School of Environment and Natural Resources, I want to acknowledge that Central Ohio is the traditional homeland of the Shawnee Nation, Miami, Wyandotte, and other indigenous nations who have strong ties to these lands. Today, individuals from a broad range of indigenous backgrounds call Columbus and Central Ohio home. As a land-grant institution, we pay our respects to ancestors, elders, and relative, re relatives and relations past, present, and emerging. Our school is developing EPN and other educational programs for 2021 that will highlight the traditional knowledge and indigenous history of our state and region, including how this can help us in our efforts to mitigate and positively adapt to regional climate change dynamics. This is an exciting week for us at OSU as we host several exciting events involving globally and nationally significant environmental thought leaders. We are thrilled to be hosting Dr. Catherine Hayhoe here through an EPN virtual event today. But I also want to let you know, all know that on Thursday, our own Rattan Lal will be receiving the World Food Prize. Rattan is an alumnus of OSU and has been a faculty member for over 33 years in the School of Environment and Natural Resources and the College of Food, Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. There will be an awards ceremony Thursday Thursday morning and in the afternoon, OSU will be hosting a program celebrating the legacy of Dr. Lal and looking to the future of the Carbon Management and Sequestration Center. Some of you may recall Dr. Lal joined us virtually last December as we celebrated World Soils Day here at the Environmental Professionals Network. I've asked Joe to post in the chat box information regarding Thursday's sessions in case any of you are interested in tuning in. Let's now move into today's program. I've watched a few episodes of Global Weirding, and I have to say, Catherine, that your program is phenomenal at communicating the complexities of climate science in a way that so many different communities of people can understand and act upon. I actually watched a couple of episodes this weekend with my son just to sort of prepare for this, and I have to tell you, my son uh, engaged, although he was commenting to me that he had been doing a lot of the things you suggested in your one program for uh, um, kids to take on. So. I was particularly proud of the fact that he uh, connected with us and saw his own ways of making a difference. This morning, we will dive into the thorny and complex interrelationships between how people's identities and political affiliations correspond to their beliefs about climate change science, a topic that is particularly salient this month as we reach the final stretch of the current election season with many campaigns and their respective policy stances being marketed in full force. Taking a step back from the political rhetoric and into the science, Catherine and an excellent panel of Ohioans will help us process and identify strategies to advance conversations on climate change, which are pivotal for identifying and implementing solutions. This afternoon, Catherine will draw upon her diverse and wide ranging experiences to propose a framework for and highlight some of the main challenges inherent to incorporating climate information into practical on the ground planning at the local to regional scale. Dr. Matt Pertola, an Ohio State professor of statistics, will moderate a panel conversation on these issues with leading Ohio State scientists after 1 p.m. I hope you are all able to join us for today's full slate of talks and topics. Please note that there are breaks featured throughout the day and you are able to sign in and sign out of this Zoom webinar as often as you like. The effort to bring Dr. Hale to Ohio State was a truly community and statewide effort. Her virtual visit today was initially scheduled to cover a range of in-person events throughout Central and Southeast Ohio. We appreciate the many groups who work with the EPN to develop this program, especially Matt and Brooke White, who helped to lead the effort with Joe Campbell and the EPN. Please see the additional partners on the slide here, and later today we will share information about associated Ohio-based programs with Dr. Hayhoe happening online later this week. Joe has asked me to give a special thanks to these partners and to the Ohio State Office of Outreach and Engagement for a small grant that helped to cover the cost of these virtual series of events. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding what climate change means for people and the place, places where we live. She's an endowed professor at Texas Tech University. 
She hosts the PBS digital series, Global Weirding, and she has been named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People, United Nations Champion of the Environment, and the World Evangelical Alliance's Climate Ambassador. As you will soon find out, she is a remarkable communicator who has received the American Geophysical Union's Climate Communication Prize and the Stephen Schneider Climate Communication Award. We encourage you to ask questions directly to Catherine during this program using the Poll Everywhere software. Nicole will post a link to Catherine's Poll Everywhere address in the chat box, which is also featured on the screen here. These questions will be delivered directly to Catherine and you can upvote and downvote and contribute your own questions via that link. And please note that this program is being recorded and will be published on EPN YouTube channel at a later date. Thank you again for joining us today and please welcome live from Lubbock, Texas, Dr. Katherine Hayhoe. It is my pleasure to be with you here today virtually uh, in replacement of a live visit, but because of the virtual nature of this uh, workshop, two presentations, two panels with all kinds of different experts discussing relevant issues, I see that we're able to have people join us from all over, not only from Ohio, which is fantastic. My talk is going to focus on Ohio, but I think it will be applicable no matter where you are. And let's get started here. The first thing we're going to do is connect with each other. So as Jeff mentioned, I would like you on your computer or your phone or your tablet or whatever you're using to go ahead and go to pollev.com slash my name, which is Catherine. There is a link in the chat that you can just click on if you prefer, I believe. And when you go there, here's the first question. A few people have already gotten there. Are you, who are you? Are you an undergraduate student, a graduate student, faculty or staff, not academic, but from Ohio or not from Ohio, just interested? All right, it looks like we have a three-way tie between faculty and staff. Oh, faculty and staff are starting to win out. The students were a little slow. Now, normally undergraduate students are the first category off the mark here. I don't know, maybe it's too early in the morning still. Um, but we've got faculty and staff up at the top, not academic, but from Ohio, second. Not from Ohio, just interested, tied with st graduate students and undergraduate students. Okay, all right, so now you know how this works. So I'm gonna be asking you questions like this throughout the presentation. And then at the very end, you have a chance to ask me questions. So if you have questions for me, just hang on to them. Don't put them in the Zoom chat or anything like that. I'm going to give you a chance to ask them at the very end. All right. So let's begin with a picture of the landscape. But by the landscape, I don't mean the geographic landscape. I mean the political landscape. Back in 1994, so 26 years ago, this is what the political landscape of the United States looked like. It was pretty symmetrical and most people were in the middle. Then over time, it changed. And if you look at people who voted in the 2017 election, which was the last time there was a federal election in the US, it looks like this. In other words, not only did people move farther apart, but the distributions became so skewed that now people are closer to the more extremes of their own party than they are to the median of the other party. What on earth does this have to do with climate change, you might be thinking? Why is she starting off a talk on climate change by talking about the political landscape? It's because it pretty much has everything to do with it. For the last 10 years, climate change has been at the very top of the most politically polarized issues in the entire United States. So back in February, the Pew Research Center, which is the source for all of this data I've been showing you so far, the Pew Research Center polled people and asked them how important they thought various issues were. And then this is a ranking of those issues by the width of the gray bar. What is the gray bar? It's how far apart people are, depending on whether they identify as Republican or Democrat. And the farthest apart that people are is on climate change and environmental protection. They're further apart than guns or the military or immigration or more. Now, if you have sharp eyes and critical thinking skills, you're gonna be saying, oh yes, but this was February, Catherine. A lot has changed since February. Yes, a lot has changed. The world has turned almost completely upside down with coronavirus, with Black Lives Matter and more. So they redid this survey. 
And the most recent survey in August shows this. Now, this is slightly different because they haven't ranked them by the width of the gray bar. So I'm gonna point out the third, second, and first widest gray bars. In third place, in terms of the most politicized issues in the US, we have coronavirus. Yes, as you will not be surprised to know that it has become a highly politicized issue. In number two, we have racial and ethnic inequalities. But what's number one? Still climate change. Yes. So here's my point. My point is that if we can figure out how to talk about climate change in a productive way, I think we can figure out how to talk about pretty much anything. And we need to be talking about things, not at people or past people, but we need to be talking about these things together. So how do we do it about climate change? Well, first I wanna talk about how we usually do it and why that doesn't work. Usually if we say, okay, if I need to talk about climate change, I need the facts. And believe me, when it comes to climate change, we have the facts, we have no shortage of them. If you just go to Google Scholar, which indexes um, scientific studies and presentations and reports, you get 2.6 million hits on the phrase climate change. We have five and soon in another year or two, six IPCC reports of thousands of pages each. We have the first, second, and third national climate assessment. We have the fourth national climate assessment, which is so big, it got split into two different volumes. Volume one was 500 pages and volume two was 1600 pages. We have thousands of scientists who are communicating the urgency of these facts. This world scientist warning from last year was signed by 11,000 scientists. And we've known these facts for a very, very long time. We've known that our planet has a natural blanket that keeps us over 30 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than we would be otherwise since the work of Fourier in the 1820s. John Tyndale identified the gases that made up that blanket, specifically carbon dioxide and methane, and he even connected them to coal mining. Eunice Foote, whose contributions have just begun to be recognized in recent years, actually calculated how much warming carbon dioxide causes. In fact, if I may just digress for a minute, there was a wonderful obituary on her written in January in the New York Times and a brand new paper that just came out about six weeks ago that reanalyzed her experimental data from 1856 to show that you could calculate the value of climate sensitivity. In other words, how much the planet would warm if we doubled levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. You could calculate a climate sensitivity value of about three degrees Celsius, which is the median value according to all the studies that have been done so far based on her data from 1856. Isn't that incredible? Then going back, we've got Arrhenius who, at, you know, in between winning a Nobel prize decided that he would just for fun calculate by hand how much each part of the planet, he did it by bands of latitude all the way up to the Arctic would warm as we increase CO2 by 50%, 100%, 200% and 300%. He thought it would take thousands of years because he didn't realize that our emissions were exponential rather than linear. And the fascinating thing is, is that Svante's mother was a Thunberg and Thunberg is also the last name of Greta Thunberg. And it turns out her father was named after Svante because he was a distant cousin. And then we have Guy Callender who rode around the world and collected weather station data in the 1930s. And based on 50 years of data showed that yes, indeed the planet was already warming. So we have the facts, we have many facts, and we talk about these facts all the time. In fact, for example, on Twitter, I keep a list of 3,116 so far, scientists who do climate, who are on social media to talk about climate. So when we see news like almost 40% of the rain that fell during Hurricane Harvey was the result of a warmer world, or it was over a hundred degrees in Siberia this summer, and that could not have happened without a warming world. 
or look at the largest wildfires in California. Only three of the top 20 have happened before 2000. And one, two, three, four, five of them have happened in 2020 and 2020 is not finished yet. When we see pictures of apocalyptic orange skies, we think to ourselves, surely we have the facts we need to convince people that this is serious. So I wanna ask you, what do you think is the most compelling climate fact? And I tried to think of almost everything I could, but I'm giving you an option of I in case there's something on my list that you think is more compelling. What is the most cl compelling climate fact in your opinion? Go to pollev.com and answer. Do you think it's the increasing CO2 levels that we measure in the ice cores, like Lonnie Thompson and many others have done at OSU? Do you think it's the melting ice sheets, rising sea levels, pictures of starving polar bears, the Western wildfires, the supersized hurricanes that we're getting in the Gulf, record-breaking floods, the toxic algae blooms, or something else? All right, it looks like and frankly, this is no surprise since this is OSU, it looks like we're getting a solid vote for increasing CO2, but Western wildfires is kind of rising because that's something that's happened pretty recently and you can see it with your eyes. Okay, increasing CO2 levels are going up even more. Mm -hmm. And then, so it looks like, okay, it looks like we hit this, this is a preview of election night. It looks like we have a winner. I'm gonna go ahead and call it for increasing CO2. But as you can see, we have no shortage of compelling facts. So we think to ourselves, and this is from one of our global weirding episodes, we think to ourselves, if they, people just knew the facts, they would change their minds, right? So metaphorically, so to speak, we back our dump truck up to the massive heap of facts that scientists have assembled since the 1800s. And we load our dump truck up and we drive it over to the person or the people that we think need to be convinced of the seriousness and urgency of this issue. We push the button, we dump our load on them. And what happens? That was a rhetorical question because I'm gonna tell you what happens. And to understand what happens, we can't draw on the physical science. We have to draw on the social sciences and even on the medical sciences in terms of understanding how our brain works. So climate changes, we get worried as we should be. We share more scary information with people because if they're not worried like we are, they should be. But what happens? What happens is the opposite of what we expected. People rejected even more inaction results and climate changes more. Why is this? Well, as neuroscientist Telly Sherratt says, and she wasn't talking about climate change when she said this, she says fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. So there's this vicious cycle where the more we load up that dump truck <laughs> and dump it on people, the more people actually freeze. And if you're like me, you might be thinking something like this, but it gets worse. People don't really have a problem with the science. And Dan Cahan is a social science researcher who's looked at this. He's found, in fact, that the smarter people are and the better they are to understand science, they're not more concerned about climate change, they're more polarized. What? Yes, he did this experiment where he asked people, is there solid evidence of global warming due mostly to human activity? And this is a softball question because those of us who follow the science know that all of the warming is human caused and then some, because according to natural factors, we should be getting cooler right now, not warmer. So if you ask me mostly, I would actually say, no, it's not mostly, it's all. But softball question, is it mostly? And then he ranked people's answers by a measure he developed called ordinary science intelligence, which is just one measure of intelligence, specifically looking at how people are able to understand data and statistics and probabilities. And what he found is a pretty weak, correlation 
between the, you know, from the first percentile, you're at 35% probability of answering this correctly. And then you get to the 99th percentile and you're at a 60% chance. That's a pretty weak correlation. But then he took this data and he divided it in half based on one thing. And thinking back to the beginning of this presentation, you can probably guess what the one thing is. Politics. And what did he find? He found that the smarter we are, the more divided we are. If you are a super smart conservative, you have less than a 20% chance of answering this question right. What? Well, here's what they concluded. And let me translate this into English. Being smarter does not make us more accepting of science per se. It just makes us better at cherry picking what we need to prove what we already believe. In other words, the smarter we are, the more we believe that we can out argue the devil. And I'm still not at the bottom yet, it gets even worse. As Tally Sherratt continues, this is the neuroscientist, she says, our brains are programmed as humans to get a kick out of information, but when we give people new information, they typically only accept it if they already believe it. If it, are, if it contradicts what they believe, their brain shuts off. And she continues, today in this modern internet era, the wealth of information available actually makes us more resistant to change because it's so easy to find a YouTube video or a website or a blog or a so-called expert who supports our pre-existing opinion on anything, on not wearing a mask, on not getting vaccinated, on climate change. And even worse, she says, the more we're exposed to contradictory information and opinions, the more polarization expands with time. Has polarization expanded with time? Yes, right? That, those are those figures that we saw at the very beginning. Part of the reason it's expanded with time is because we are increasingly exposed to more and more and more contradicting information and opinions. And there's actually a word for what happens. It's called, or sorry, a phrase I should say, it's called the backfire effect. So with climate change, for example, if we've built our identity on rejecting what we believe are so-called liberal issues, and of course the number of thermometer gives you is not liberal or conservative, but climate change is the most politically polarized issue in the country, right? So if our identity is built on, to some extent, our politics, then scientific facts come across as a personal attack on our identity. And I actually saw this just the other day on Twitter, where if you follow me on Twitter, you know, I get a lot of people attacking me every day. And as long as they're not really, really offensive, I usually reply at least once saying, you know, please update your understanding with, and then I provide a link to a lot of scientific facts. And one man replied very tellingly. He said, don't insult me like that. So he viewed science as an insult. Why? Because for him, it was an identity issue. It wasn't a knowledge issue. So what happens is people double down on their denial. And the backfire effect has been observed in many places. It's been observed with genetically modified organisms, GMOs, where when people were exposed to information they didn't agree with, it created negative emotions. And the stronger the emotions, the less likely they were to change their minds. It's been documented with 9-11. People were more likely to believe it was linked to Iraq after they were shown it wasn't. And with climate change, people are less ambivalent and more entrenched in denial after being exposed to accurate information about the science. So at this point, my internal dialogue sort of looked like this. And it even looked like this. Because by exposing people to correct information, I was being, I am, I still am part of entrenching their denial. Yes. So, okay, how do we dig ourselves out of this hole? How do we stop this vicious cycle where we're worried, we load up our dump truck, we dump it on people, their denial gets even more entrenched and climate changes more. It begins with this. It begins with recognizing the real problems. 
And the real problems we have are not lack of intelligence, lack of information, lack of education, or lack of science. Now, don't get me wrong. As a scientist, I think we could always do with more science. But these are not the fundamental problems that are driving the politicization of climate change. The fundamental problems are identity politics. People are actually building their identity on their politics. So the tail is wagging the dog, so to speak. Once you identify with something politically, all of a sudden you just accept all the issues that go with it. Then we have the problem of complacency or psychological distance. We think climate change is far away rather than being close. And lastly, we have solution aversion because we're told continuously that the only solutions to climate change are negative or bad or punitive or harmful. And so why would you wanna fix it if the solution is worse than the problem, so to speak, is how people think. Let me dig into these a little bit more to show you what I mean. First of all, does a thermometer give you a different answer depending on how you vote? It literally does not, but we think it does. Here was a really kind of shocking study that Larry Hamilton, who was a social scientist in New Hampshire did. In 2017, they had a very warm January. It was in fact eight degrees warmer than average in January. And they'd had a number of very warm Januaries. In fact, they'd had one, two, three, four, five, six, and this was the seventh in the last 30 years. So in February, Larry asked people, was January warmer than average? And again, he's asked them in February, it was eight degrees warmer than average, and they could see the number on their own thermometers in their backyards or their cars. Then he asked them one more question, who did you vote for in the last election? I mean, is this not absolutely stunning? 50% of people who voted for Trump didn't think that their own thermometer showed them it was warmer than average. When we ask people, do you think global warming is happening? 72% of the US says yes. This is from the Yale program on climate communication. I'm gonna show you quite a few of these maps because I think they're so fantastic. They break out the data by county or by congressional district. And I've highlighted Franklin County right here. When you ask people, is it happening? 79% of people in Franklin County would say yes. But then if you divide that out politically, oh, sorry, I forgot, I zoomed in here. You can zoom in so you can actually see how Columbus and Cleveland kind of stand out. But if you divide that politically, here's what it looks like. In the 115th district, which I believe is the one that you're in, yes, 88% um, of Democrats and 44% of Republicans would say that global warming is happening. So this is what I'm talking about. And then to put the icing on the cake, a study that came out five or four years ago found that promulgation of scientific information on climate change has no effect. And in fact, other research, like I said, might show that it actually makes it worse. So what does have an effect on people's public concern? They were specifically looking at public concern. What does have an effect? Information-based science advocacy has a minor effect. Political mobilization by um, elites would be, you know, leaders, thought leaders, and advocacy groups is critical. Wow. So we have this problem with politicization, and then we have a problem with psychological distance. What, what do I mean by that? Well, how many people think that global warming will harm plants and animals? Again, these are the counties of the US. Anywhere that's orange is more than 50%. And the darker orange, the more people said yes. If it's less than 50%, it's blue. But you can see it's maybe there's one blue county. So we agree largely that global warming will harm plants and animals. It will harm future generations. This might look like the same app, but it isn't. It will harm future generations, we agree. It will harm people in developing countries so not us, but people in developing countries. Okay, starting to see a bit more blue. It will harm people in the US. Now we're pale yellow with a little bit more blue. And then here's the kicker question. It will it harm, oh, sorry. I divided it out by 
uh, Democrat or Republican. We're already seeing a huge divide here. Will it harm people in the US? 81% of Democrats say yes and 35% of Republicans say yes. But will it harm you personally? No. Most people don't think it will harm them personally. Why? Because the number one image we associate with climate change is typically of an animal that we haven't seen. In Franklin County, only 43% of people think global warming will harm them personally. And in Franklin County, there aren't a lot of polar bears wandering around. This is the number one image that jumps into people's head when you say global warming. Or if we think of people, the images of people we have are people who live far away, who appear to be doing something pretty ordinary, like just walking along a road, although there is water on it. So we don't associate this with an immediate and urgent impact on us. That's what psychological distance is. The idea that it's far away in space or time or relevance or that it's abstract rather than being concrete. And then we have solution aversion. So for example, one of the most well-known politicians to reject climate science is Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma. He is so adamant about rejecting climate science that he went, he's gone and written an entire book on the global warming hoax. He's known for stunts like bringing a very concrete and tangible snowball into the Senate floor to say, where's global warming? But when he was being interviewed back in 2012 by Rachel Maddow, and I got this quote from the transcript, he said, do you realize I was actually on your side of this issue when I first chaired that Senate Environment Committee? I was on your side till when, till it snowed? No. I was on your side until I found out how much it would cost to fix it. And this is one of my favorite screen captures. Um, Marco Rubio is saying, I'm not going to destroy the economy over climate change. And then read the subhead there. A million Florida homes at risk due to climate change. If that isn't going to destroy the economy, I don't know what will. A brand new study just came out, you can see the date here, September 21st, where they found specifically that giving people recommendations of what they should be doing, so in other words, wagging a bony finger of judgment at them and saying, here's what you should be doing, it decreased their willingness to take personal action, to support pro-climate political candidates, and to trust scientists. Oh my goodness. So how on earth do we break this vicious cycle you might be saying? Well, here's where we really hit the rock bottom and we're heading up the other side. And these maps actually help to show us because the darkest blue map is not, do you think it matters to you? The darkest blue map is, do you ever talk about it? It turns out that people don't. In fact, if you zoom in on Ohio, only 35% of people in Franklin County talk about global warming, at least occasionally. And it's one of the lightest blue counties, I think the lightest blue county in the entire state. So most people in the state are below 30%. And here's the connection. If we don't talk about something, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we ever want to do anything about it? So how do we break the vicious cycle? by sharing, by talking about the right type of information, not by loading up our dump truck with all the massive, depressing, scary scientific facts like this, but rather by talking about why and how climate change matters to us here in ways that are here and now and relevant and concrete and what are some truly positive, constructive solutions that people can get on board with? So climate changes and we get worried, remember? But here's where we break the cycle. We break the cycle by sharing how it affects us and what we can do together to fix it. And research by Matthew Goldberg from Yale, who's a communication researcher has showed that this actually creates a true positive climate feedback, a real positive feedback, where the more friends and family, people we know talk about it, the more we know, the more we know, the more concerned we are, and the more concerned we are, the more we talk about it. So instead, we feel empowered by knowing why it matters to us and what we can do about it, 
Those have to go side by side. You can't have one without the other. And action results. As neuroscientist Tally Sherratt says, the human brain is built to associate forward action, which is what we want when it comes to climate change, right? Forward action with reward, not with avoiding harm. So reframe, and again, she's not even talking about climate change here. Reframe your message so the information you provide induces hope, not dread. Wow. So how do we actually do this? What are the nitty gritties? We need to begin by bonding, by connecting, and by inspiring. Begin our conversation with something we agree on rather than something we disagree on. Talk about why it matters to us and talk about positive solutions that people can get on board with. Now, here's the thing. The Yale program on climate communication shows that when it comes to climate change, we're not black or white believers or deniers, yes or no. We're part of a spectrum. And the majority of us are alarmed or concerned about climate change. Here's how this connects to what I just talked about. For those of us who are alarmed, we bond over the more scary data showing that we were right to be alarmed. Let me repeat that because this really has to sink in. If we're alarmed about something, if we're alarmed about coronavirus, if we're alarmed about people not taking it seriously enough, if we're alarmed about climate change and people not taking it seriously enough, we bond, if we're alarmed, we bond with each other over information that justifies us and proves that we were right. So here's the thing though. We're trying to talk to other people, not just people who are alarmed. And I often assume actually that most of the people who attend this are alarmed. So I'm gonna do something that I've never done before. I wanna ask you to go ahead and take a survey right now, okay? Now, the link just got dropped into the chat. So you can click on the link directly or you can Google Sassy Yale or Six America Super Short Survey. That's what it stands for. And I want you to take this super short quiz. It's just a couple of questions. I'm Canadian, so I use a couple collect colloquially to mean, you know, three or four, not one or two. It's just a couple of questions or a few questions if you prefer. And it will actually show you likely where you fall on the six Americas. So go ahead and go to the chat, or if you wanna just Google it, or if you wanna type in this, you can. Go to this survey and I want you to do this survey right now and tell me what you are. So go to the Sassy survey, answer the questions and tell me what result it gives you. Because I often assume that most people here would be alarmed, but I'm not sure. So go ahead. Oh, you guys are so fast. You're awesome. Like I said, I've never done this before in a presentation. So I was kind of curious how long it would take, but you're showing me that it doesn't take that long. You are very quick. All right. It looks like my assumption was pretty accurate. We have got 80, 83, 84% alarmed. Okay. And then 16 ish percent concerned. Oh, 15%. Okay. So about an 85, 15% split. All right, that is so interesting. It's like I said, it's what I suspected, but now we know, you know, how many people we've got. We've got 237 people on this call. So assuming even half of you filled this out, I think it's probably pretty accurate. All right, so, and we who are alarmed, which are 85% of the people on this call, and even probably some of you who are concerned or cautious, or concerned. When we see headlines like this, Greenland and Antarctica are melting six times faster. Methane levels have hit a scary record high. NOAA warns of extraordinary increase in coastal flooding. Now there's a clock in New York counting down the time to disaster in seconds. And if you'll note, these are all headlines from this year alone. When we see headlines like this, they justify our alarm. They make us feel like, yeah, we were right. We were right to be concerned, we're right to be alarmed, we're right to be advocating for change, and we bond over these. But here's the thing, we are 26% of the population, with a few concerned as well, <coughs> but that's not enough to wag the dog. 
In fact, <coughs> excuse me, if anything's wagging the dog, it's probably the tail end, the dismissives down here, the 7%. So often what people say to me is, I want to figure out how to talk to a dismissive. Tell me the magic secret to changing a dismissive's mind. Because we all know a dismissive. It's somebody who cannot leave climate change alone. It is our uncle, our parent, our old college roommate, our neighbor, even our colleague, who every time there's a headline about how, oh, you know, scientists find out that this isn't happening as fast, or I bet they fake the data, or it's cold outside, where is global warming now? A dismissive is somebody who brings it up every time. They can't stop talking about climate change. They're obsessed with talking about climate change. But here's the thing. My personal definition of a dismissive, and I did a whole thread on this on Twitter, is somebody who, if an angel from God with brand new tablets of stone reading global warming is real and foot high letters of flame was hand delivered to them, they would not change their minds because a dismissive person has built their identity on rejecting climate change. So when we're talking about climate change, we have to move on without the dismissives. There is no secret to changing their mind. I honestly think it takes a miracle and I feel like I might've seen two or three miracles in 10 years, but I don't think that I had much to do with them. I merely admire them and are inspired by them. The good news though, is that 93% of us are not dismissive. And these are the ones that we want to have our conversations with. People who are concerned, cautious, disengaged and doubtful. How can we bond with people who are not us, but who are not dismissive. We bond over something we agree with people on, and it can be something that you might think is unrelated or trivial. We can bond over the fact that we live in Columbus or Ohio or Texas or Wisconsin. We can bond over the fact that we're a parent or we have a shared faith. We enjoy a mutual activity, hiking or birding or winter activities. We have shared military experience, or we're both farmers, or we come from a farming background. I've bonded with people over knitting and over cooking. So whoever you are, you are someone unique. You have a unique set of values, of loves, of concerns, of fears, of life experiences. And the most important thing for you to start with when you're having a conversation with somebody is something that you truly share with them. So who am I? Um, I'm a scientist, so I can definitely bond with people over science. And a lot of people are curious about science. I live in Texas, so I bond with people over living in Texas. I really enjoy winter sports, so I bond with people over snow. I'm a mom, so I bond with people over being a parent. I'm a Christian, so I bond with people over my shared faith. A couple of years ago, after giving a talk similar to this at a big university, a fellow scientist approached me and he said, I've been trying to reach out to faith communities, but I can't get my foot in the door. Where would you recommend I begin? And I said, well, I suggest you begin with the faith community that you have the most in common with. Where do you yourself attend? You know, what, what religion, what faith tradition, what denomination? Oh, I'm an atheist, he said. So I said, stop. You're not the right person to be connecting with people over a shared faith because you don't share their faith. So I said instead, you know, what do you do? I said, you know, are you a Rotarian? No. Do you hike? No. You know, I went through a few things and finally he said, well, I dive. I said, well, you dive. Well, how about you start connecting with divers? Because you could go to PADI certification programs. You could talk about how climate change is affecting the ocean. Whoever you are is unique. So now it's your turn. And I want one word from you, just one word. If you have to use two words, connect them with a dot or a dash. You'll see why in a second. So if you have to say mother-in-law, make sure you have a dot or a dash between mother-in-law. Why do you care about climate change? Give me one word why you care. And I'm not looking for the same answer here. I want different answers. That's why we're using a wordle, you're not voting. I want different answers because there is no one answer. Who you are is totally different. Now, who you are, one aspect of who you are, you share with many other people. So if you are a Christian, you share that with many people here in the US. If you're an academic, you share that with many people in Columbus. 
If you're a naturalist or a trail lover, you share that with other naturalists and trail lovers. If you're a member of a family, a parent, a brother, a sister, a daughter, a grandparent, you're part of that too. I love what we're seeing here. So I care because I'm a student, a person of color, a spiritual person, because I'm young, because I'm old, because I'm a dog fanatic, because I'm a farmer. Exactly. Because I'm a hiker, because I'm a hockey player. Oh, yes. There's been a st studies in Canada about outdoor rinks, which is how we all grew up skating in Canada and how the outdoor rink season is getting shorter and shorter. And now when I go home for Christmas, half of our outdoor rinks are covered in water and most of our family members can't even put one in our backyard anymore like we used to. Look at this, I love the diversity. Oh, we've got a poet in there, that's fantastic. A sailor, a lover, a humanitarian, a swimmer, comrade, aunt. We care about this fundamentally because we're humans, right? So this is where you start. Now you know where you can start a conversation. You just put it right here. So we start a conversation with something we agree on. That's step one. And then step two is to explain why it matters to us because of who we are. So if we live in Ohio, we care about climate change because it affects our lake effect snow, our flood risk, our algae blooms, our city. If we care about it because we're a Christian, we care about it because the Bible says that we have responsibility over every living thing on this planet. If we care about winter sports, we care about it because the winter sports season is shrinking. It's affecting bird distributions. It's affecting our crops. It's affecting our income and our infrastructure and our health and our kids' future and the economy and national security. And Chris Chu, who's a researcher right here at Texas Tech, he's found something really interesting. He has found out that when we explain how climate change is relevant to us here and now in ways that matter to me as a hockey player, a skier, an inhabitant of Ohio, a parent, a naturalist, we not only decrease the, the psychological distance, he found that we decrease the ideological polarization too. In other words, the split, the pol political split decreases when we bring the impacts near to us because what unites us becomes more than what divides us. Rather than focusing on the politics, which divide us potentially, we're focusing instead on the fact that we're both parents or we're both farmers or we're both students or we both care about the same things. So not only does it bring the issue here and now and relevant, but it again, it decreases our polarization too. So rather than talking about how global temperature is increasing, we can talk about what's happening, where we live. And these are just, you know, a few headlines about, you know, coronavirus is compounding the heat wave and we've got deadly heat waves. And instead of talking simply about how heavy precipitation is increasing, which it is, we can talk about how epic flooding is one of the signals of climate change in the Midwest. We care about climate change because it affects our water, our food, our security, our economy, our health, and more. We care about climate change because of who we are, and this is what we have to talk about. But we can't stop there. There's one more thing we have to talk about, and then you need to ask me your questions. So get your questions ready. But the last thing we have to talk about is what? The last thing we have to talk about is solutions. I love talking about what's happening in Texas with army bases putting in clean energy, with wind turbines replacing oil rigs. But you can talk about what's happening in Ohio. Columbus has a carbon neutral plan and they're moving forward with it. Ohio State has a carbon neutral plan. They put it in place in 2008 and they just reorganized their general education courses to focus on sustainability as Jeff was talking about. There's programs to help farmers in Ohio put solar on their land. Project Drawdown has dozens of positive climate solutions. If you're wondering how to talk about them or what to say, just go look it up and you'll learn amazing things, including that one climate solution is indigenous land management, which of course yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day. That's a climate solution. I love talking about surprising solutions in farming and in faith groups or in industry, 
Walmart, Microsoft, Apple, even British Petroleum, although we're not quite sure how they're going to meet that goal, but still, they have a goal. I love talking about what's happening around the world, what kids are doing, what's happening in unexpected places where they don't have access to fossil fuels. These solutions are inspiring and they can take us from concerned or cautious to alarmed because they can address our concern or anxiety. As Renee Lertzman says, she's a psychologist, the solution to our anxiety is not more scary facts, it is action. Action matters and people support action. People say a presidential candidate's views on global warming are important. They think a president should do more to address global warming. Wow. People agree that citizens should do more to address global warming. Wow. People agree that, that requiring utilities to produce 20% of their electricity from renewable sources. People agree that taxing fossil fuel companies. People agree that regulating CO2 as a pollutant is important. And I'm just gonna divide this out for just a second. 63% of Republicans agree that regulating CO2 as a pollutant is important. Wow. And then do you support funding research in renewable energy? Yes, pretty much everybody does. 95% of Democrats and 79% of Republicans. So talking about climate change is really important because people aren't hearing enough about it, but overloading them with doom and gloom just paralyzes them. So in, in guilt-based solutions turn us off. Instead, we need to share locally relevant impacts here and now with constructive solutions. People want to hear more about those and that spurs conversations that really truly make a difference. How do we do this? I didn't give you my TED talk. This was not my TED talk. My TED talk picks up from here if you want more. But the way we can make a difference is by talking about climate change. Thank you so much for listening. Go ahead and give me your questions now. And please stay on for the incredible panel that's coming up on the hour where they're gonna dig into this in a lot more detail. You do not want to miss that. All right, go ahead and give me your questions here. And you can write full questions. You don't have to have any weird dots or dashes or anything like that. But here's the fun part. You can upvote the questions that you most want me to answer. So even if you don't have a question, go ahead and go to polyv.com slash Catherine. You can, if you click top, you'll see the top upvoted questions and you can upvote the questions that you want me to get in there. And you have a chance, a chance to get your question in because I'm not seeing any questions yet. I'm surprised you guys have been so fast on all the polling results and now everybody's like, oh, no questions. Oh, okay, here we go. We got a question. All right, perfect. Catherine? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so we were having issues with people submitting questions. I think they were just getting the poll questions but not able to submit while you were doing your presentation. So I'm not sure if that was supposed to happen. Um, well, it looks like they're submitting now. Okay. So I think we're good. So I'm That's sorry good. if you're having problems. I'm not sure what the problem would be, um, but it looks like the answers are coming in now. And we definitely got a okay. lot of answers for the other ones too. All right. So our top question here with 10 upvotes is, do you recommend talking solutions that are happening or that are possible or some of both? That's a great question. You know what? I've never gotten that question before. Um, I say both. I think it's really important to emphasize that things are already happening today. It's not a giant boulder sitting at the bottom of a hill. The boulder is already rolling down the hill very slowly. And talking about all the hands that are on that boulder pushing it down the hill is really important. But we also know that we don't quite have enough yet. And I'll be talking about that in my next presentation in another hour. And because we don't have enough yet, we have to talk about what is possible. The fact that, for example, through efficiency alone, just efficiency, the US could cut its carbon emissions 50%. I mean, that's a pretty stunning possible solution that I don't think a lot of people know. But at the same time, it's really important to say, hey, Texas, the home to oil and gas is already powered 20% by wind and Houston, which is home to the big oil and gas companies, joins Columbus with a carbon neutral goal by 2050. 
that's already happening. So I definitely think both are important to show us that it's already on its way, but we need more and we know what that more looks like. All right. Should we talk about climate solutions that need federal approval or more on the state or local level? Um, I actually like to talk about all of them. I like to talk about the fact that there are bipartisan caucuses for climate solutions in Congress and Senate, which I know sounds almost unreal in 2020. Um, and the fact that there is significant bipartisan support though muted for a price on carbon with the Climate Leadership Council. Um, I like to talk about what's happening in other countries because people often feel like, oh, we could do everything we could, but if China's not doing anything, why does it matter? And I like to point out, well, sure, China has a lot of coal, but they also have more wind and solar than the US. And frankly, they're beating the pants off the US right now. Are you okay with that, Uncle Joe? <laughs> um, but I like talking about local solutions that are happening in Ohio, that are happening in Columbus, that are happening at OSU, and things that I'm doing myself. Individual action is important because that's what gives us hope. Now we need system-wide change, but a system's made up of individuals. So when I talk about solutions, I talk about what's happening in other countries. I talk about potential federal solutions. I talk about what my state is doing, what my city is, well, not my city, unfortunately, but what other cities are doing in Texas. Um, but I also talk about, you know what? Every year I pick up two new habits. I do most of my talks virtually and I only travel in person when I have huge bundles of talks in one place. I reduce my food waste. We eat less meat. I love my plug-in car. I talk about my individual solutions too. It's all part of the whole package. For dismissive people, how do you recommend we bridge the gap? Well, what I've found is that sometimes, not always, but sometimes with dismissive people, we can agree on solutions, even if we don't agree on the problem. So as long as they see another benefit to the solution, like the farmer I was visiting here in Texas, who probably was pretty dismissive. And I noticed he had some old oil uh, pumps on his land, but his neighbor had wind turbines. So I said to him, I sort of gathered up my courage and I said, is there a reason that you don't have any wind turbines? And he said, yes, there is. And so I said, why? Because I was sort of expecting him to, you know, go into a diatribe against, you know, the United Nations and global warming. He said, I've been on the list for two years. My neighbor got them and didn't tell me about it. I've been waiting for my wind turbines. I said, oh, so you want them? And he's like, well, of course I do. The check arrives in the mail. So often we can actually connect on solutions, even when we can't connect on the reality of the problem. All right. Two more minutes for questions. And these are great questions. And I love that you're upvoting them. It makes it so helpful. How do you talk to somebody who wants things to change, but is still stuck in their political beliefs? They're stuck in their political beliefs because they don't think there is anything they can do. So I would introduce them to, I'm assuming you're talking about people on the right-hand side of the spectrum. I would introduce them to, for example, uh, Republic N, not N, but N, an organization by Republican Congressman Bob Inglis that talks about free market solutions. I would introduce them to the Climate Leadership Council that includes a lot of big corporations, even oil and gas companies talking about carbon pricing. I would introduce them to what military leaders are saying. I would introduce them to people who share their values and share their politics. And if you go to newclimatevoices.org, and if you don't mind dropping that in the chat, Nicole, newclimatevoices.org, that has a few of those voices. You'll find mine there too, but also some other voices. Take them to those voices so that they know that there are solutions that they can get on board with. And um, ooh, do we think that documents like the IPCC that are not so easy to understand actually make people <laughs> more polarized? I think that these documents exist for a purpose and they are to inform the international negotiations. That's the purpose of the IPCC reports. But when we use them as a weapon, so to speak, metaphorically, although they are very heavy and large, to hit people upside the head with, with more doom and gloom, if that's what they're being used for, then that's when they can be counterproductive. Everything has a purpose, and if we, but we've taken things like that and we've started to use them for other things that they were not actually intended to be used for, and that's where it gets counterproductive. Um, what specific words or transition phrases can we use? I'm gonna do a super speed round here on the last couple of questions. Start with what we care about and then say, and did you know? 
because people like information. Did you know? And then offer a really interesting thing that is not confrontational, that addresses their values and what they care about. Did you know? A simple phrase. Some people argue that solar energy is worse than fossil fuel use. That is plenty debunked. And if you want any, um, send me a message on social media and I send, I'll send you lots of links showing that fossil fuel use is a lot worse. And in fact, we have a global weirding episode on fossil fuels too. So check out our global weirding episodes on fossil fuels because they get into that whole question. Um, all right, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your awesome questions. Do not go away. We have a great panel coming up next. And then I have a second, much more technical talk about how do we use climate information to actually plan for the future coming up in another hour. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you to everyone who asked questions today. You've given us so much to think about and we will seek to heed your advice to get involved in more efforts to keep talking about and exploring together climate solutions here in Ohio. Um, um, we have recorded this. Uh, we've done about 100 EPNs over the years, um, or 100, 100 events like this. I'd say this is one of the strongest presentations we've seen. Catherine, you do an amazing job of communicating this. There were so many things that I took away from this. We will have a recording of this webinar available. I will be circulating this to various my communities. We'll be circulated to students. We'll be circulated to faculty who could not attend. I'll be circulating to my faith community. I encourage you all when Nicole sends out the information about this presentation, please share it with your communities and let them sort of hear some of this message as well. As is our EPN tradition, we wanna recognize Catherine for her uh, uh, participation today. Uh, we will have an electronic certificate of appreciation. Um, and uh, normally we give you a framed print with the beautiful scene of the uh, uh, Olentangy River, some sort of natural setting in Ohio. Uh, you along with many environmental professionals who participated today are helping us learn for life and to positively shape our world. Um, Everyone, please enjoy, oh, uh, Catherine, you enjoy your one hour break. Uh, and we are excited that you will be joining us again this afternoon to increase our knowledge on climate science and communication. I'll now hand it over to Joe to tell us what we can expect for the next element of the program. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Catherine. Um, what a wonderful morning we've had so far. We are gonna reconvene in eight minutes. So at 11.10, we'll be back with our Ohio-based panel. So in the meantime, please um, take a little break. Um, and uh, Catherine, I imagine that your website is still up and open um, with those questions that have been put out there. So thank you everyone for participating with that. Um, and I will put up instructions um, here on the screen about how we'll ask questions using Zoom to our panel, which will start in about eight minutes. So see you all soon. All right, welcome back everyone. I'm so excited to continue the dialogue here on talking climate um, here in the purple state that is Ohio. Um, Troy Tofel. Fred Yoder, Samia Bray, and Aaron Wilson will be all um, lining up here in a minute to speak. Um, each of our panelists will take a few minutes to share their own thoughts on what we just heard from Dr. Hayhoe and how to constructively talk about climate change here in Ohio. Um, then we're gonna have a full panel together um, where each of our panelists will be um, sharing live and, and on video um, their comments and thoughts. Um, at any point during this upcoming session, so for the next uh, 40 minutes, um, you will have the opportunity to use the Q&A box that's located in your taskbar here in Zoom uh, to pose questions to the full panel or to individual speakers. So if you have a question for Aaron, um, specifically, type it in um, at, at Aaron and then into the Q&A box. Nicole Jackson and I will be monitoring uh, the questions that are coming through there. And at times our speakers, if they're able, will answer their questions typed in through the Q&A, which you should all be able to see the different questions that come through and the answers that are um, responded to. Um, and we'll go from there. So first up, our first two speakers will be Troy Tofel and Fred Yoder. Um, their bios are here on the screen. And after Fred, we will hear from Samia Bray and Aaron Wilson. And they will just go right into speaking in sequential order. So Troy, if you are ready to go, um, I will hand it over to you. Hello everyone. Um, as Dr. Campbell mentioned, um, my name is Troy Tofil. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I am a fourth year undergraduate student majoring in biology, serving as a deputy director in the sustainability committee of the undergraduate student government. First off, I would like to thank Dr. Campbell 
and the Environmental Professionals Network for allowing me to speak with you all today. It is such a privilege to be able to share the student perspective on issues such as climate change and environmental policy, especially at a university like Ohio State. On behalf of students, I would also like to thank Dr. Hayhoe for taking the time to share her research and facilitate conversations such as this. The issue of human-induced climate change is one that is and will be greatly impacting us over the course of our lifetimes. Therefore, it is essential that we are able to communicate ways in which we can be better advocates for addressing these problems and forming solutions across the country, the world, and in the Buckeye State as well. Now, my perception of climate change and my activism that addresses it have largely been shaped by the fact that I am both a lifelong resident of Ohio and an undergraduate student attending The Ohio State University. When people typically discuss climate change, oftentimes extreme weather events are mentioned. However, being from Ohio, I personally have never experienced a drought, a forest fire, a hurricane, or anything to the like. In addition, climate change is an issue that is difficult to conceptualize. Changes that are taking place right now, such as warming oceans and glacial melting, take years to have a noticeable effect. And by that point, it is too late. So, as a resident of Ohio, it is often hard to connect those macroscopic changes to our own lives, as they don't really pose an imminent threat to our modern way of life. Therefore, in today's society, being a responsible and conscientious young adult requires an attention to detail and an overall concern for the greater good. For me personally, my interest in biology, animals, and nature as a whole have really influenced my concern for, pres for the preservation of the world. At Ohio State, I have been fortunate to connect with students and faculty alike who share these concerns. However, for many people, they can just go about their lives and not even think twice about what is happening across the planet. So, as a concerned student and an involved member of society, my activism is focused on collaborating with my peers in engaging those people and educating them about the very real ways that climate change is going to affect us in the future. Because in order for us to solve this, we all have to be involved. So on that note, I really wanted to mention one of the projects that I have been organizing over the past year, and that is Campus Sustainability Month. This is a university-wide collaboration currently taking place during the month of October that is structured to recognize and celebrate all of the sustainability work that happens at OSU. This program is also targeted at raising awareness for sustainable causes and bringing to light issues within sustainability in higher education. At the core of Campus Sustainability Month, we are trying to highlight the intersectionality of sustainable issues because solving climate change and the problems that it causes are not simply based upon a scientific solution. Therefore, we have outlined four weekly themes that we have and will be highlighting over the course of the month. They are, equity, justice, and sustainability, climate change and climatology, natural resources and food management, and green energy, technology, and business, which are all areas of life that have been impacted by human activity connected to climate change. This event today is a cross-organizational collaboration that we are so happy to have included in Campus Sustainability Month. And it has meant a lot to students to be involved in conversations surrounding these issues. Every day, Students like me are fighting on campus for change. It is our future and the future of our families that are at stake if we don't do something now. The politicization of issues such as climate change needs to be ended it has, as it has been one of the biggest barriers to tangible solutions in environmental policy, renewable infrastructure, and the overall perceptions of climate science and its integrity. Education, engagement, advocacy, these are the biggest tools a student has when trying to mitigate climate change. Through student-centric programs and projects, such as Campus Sustainability Month, the encouragement of student engagement in our democratic processes, such as voting and protest, and being a part of panels and discussions such as these, we are better able to contribute to solving these issues together. I'm extremely thankful for this opportunity to educate myself and my peers on the science behind conducting conversations regarding climate change. And I hope that everyone here today leaves knowing that there are Ohio State students and young adults across the country invigorated and excited 
to be a part of the movement we will see to address climate issues and the future of sustainability. That is all I have to say for now. So I'm open to any questions that y'all may have as they may pertain to Campus Sustainability Month or the undergraduate student government as a whole. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature in the Zoom taskbar if you would like. Thank you. My name is Fred Yoder and uh, it's a pleasure to be on this um, talk today. Uh, I really appreciated the presentation we had this morning. And one of the things that, that I want people to know is I'm a real farmer. I farm just west of Columbus here in Ohio. And uh, I'm also the um, chair of the North American Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance, which that gets me a lot of international work. I've been to all the COP meetings. And what we really have trying to do is, is show people around the world and also in Ohio and, and the rest of the states that agriculture has a chance to be a real, uh, a real chance to be the, the solution for this. So I, I just want to tell you that it's hard to get farmers to talk about climate change. You know, I, uh, one of the things that uh, that farmers are notorious for is, is they're very conservative. And you ask them if they believe in climate change, they'll say, well, um, probably not. But you ask them, if, have you seen any weather pattern changes? Absolutely, we've seen weather changes. And so it's the way you frame it. So they will admit that their things have changed. Uh, one of the things that uh, they're a little bit hypocritical on is this farmers are very, uh, good at, uh, at explaining how the science will support uh, GMOs or other technology, but uh, they, they kind of deny the, the, the climate uh, science. I don't know how we ever got to make this such a political uh, deal, but it, we have. And, and I, I do appreciate the remarks this morning, but we have to take the politics out of it. One of the ways you do that is we found out that we, we talk about climate smart agriculture. And uh, I'm, I'm also a co-chair of, of a nonprofit called Solutions from the Land. And we use the CSA or Climate Smart Agriculture, three pillars as a way to get farmers to talk about it. Pillar one is sustainable intensification. That sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. We have to figure out how to produce more with less, but that also includes profitability. Farmers respond to economic success. Pillar two is adaptation to the changing weather patterns and also making your system more resilient. And if you do that, that's where, that's where all the technology and, and precision agriculture comes in. Farmers are very anxious to, to accept that. The third pill, pillar is uh, carbon sequestration or reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. But if you do pillar one into pillar two, pillar three happens automatically. That's why, why I think we make a big mistake by starting out talking to farmers about reducing their carbon footprint to start with when we really need to be emphasizing the, the, the availability of other practices that actually will, will make economic sense. One of the things we have in Ohio here is we have some water quality issues. H2 Ohio is a great program that our governor has uh, put out there. And one of the things that, that we have to do is, is put certain things in, in place like cover crops and no-till, which helps water quality, but guess what? It also helps in solving our, our greenhouse gas emissions. So. Again, it, it's well. If you start touting the value of of uh, what what uh, organic matter is in your soil, for instance, uh, one percent organic matter additional in your soil will will hold an extra twenty five thousand gallon of water. Well, what's that do for in extreme wet conditions? It'll hold another. It's got more capacity, but also in extreme dry conditions, you have extra reserves there where you can use. So it's really important that. Uh, you talk about the economics. You know, even if, if you uh, use cover crops, you can show a farmer how you can save up to $100 an acre just by scavenging some of those excess uh, nutrients that have gotten away. But while you're still doing that, you're also sequestering carbon. And by not stirring the soil, that, that, that carbon is, is uh, secure in the soil and stays there. You know, when I was uh, growing up with my father, we, we planted from the 1st of May to the end of June, two months. But today, things have changed so much that if I don't get my crops planted within 10 days to two weeks, I've missed that optimum window for, for, uh, uh, for top end yields. So it's really important to talk about the economics. I know one thing, I would never go back to farming like I used to uh, with the, the old conventional way. It makes a lot more sense to do it this way. And also, it, but when we can become a solution, when a farmer can become a solution to, to uh, climate change, they're gonna get them. You know, my son always talks about, you know, with, the way we've exploited the uh, productivity of corn and soybeans 
can you imagine if we were paid to uh, sequester carbon if it was not tied to the to the uh, crop itself farmers would overdo it so give us a chance figure out a way that we can economically gain by uh, sequestering carbon with that giant solar panel out there with corn and soybeans and we'll be able to do that so anyway I, I appreciate the chance to talk about things as a regular farmer we can do this I look forward to your questions thank you well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hayhoe, for presenting the case to bond, connect, and inspire. Troy, thank you for your work with the Campus Sustainability Month. And Fred, wow, thank you for sharing your lived experience as a farmer. I really, I noted down your idea about uh, being paid to sequester uh, CO2 like corn and soybean subsidies. So as I'm working on some of the, the work that I do, if there's an opportunity to advocate for that, I count, count me in on that. Um, I also wish to thank Joe and Nicole and the entire EPN team for convening today's conversation. Greetings, my name is Samia Bray. My comments today come as a result of a legacy that I inherited from my grandparents. You see, in the early 60s, they used their democratic agency at a time when they could not vote. And they migrated from the Jim Crow South to Northeast Ohio. So I, uh, I actually sit here before you today as a member of the first, uh, one of the first in my generation, in my family, with the right to vote and also to obtain a master's of business administration. Um, it's their vision, their courage and their strength that in inspires me to do the work that I do at the intersection of democracy, equity and the environment. So as a consultant, I get to work on some of the most innovative uh, projects and with some of the most amazing organizations in the renewable and clean energy space. One that comes to mind is an organization called Black Environmental Leaders Association. They were founded in Northeast Ohio and they are now moving statewide. And they stand as stewards of both the natural and the built environment through collaboration and partnership raising awareness and advocating for environmental and economic justice for all. Together, they are informing policy and programming within all sectors of the green environment. But the members of Black environmental leaders understand something and it is this, that they and their allies, they came together for a purpose, very much like we did today, our concern for the climate. And it is that interest that brought us in the same room together. However, similar to what Dr. Hayhoe talked about, they know and understand that it is our collective humanity that fuels and sustains our ongoing journey together. You see, 2020 for me has provided a chance to sharpen our collective 2020 vision on how we all can support environmental justice through an equity lens. The time is here for all of us to advocate, incubate and inform. That is a strategy of black environmental leaders where we seek to advocate on behalf of all, to incubate and help others understand and to inform um, as it regards to uh, climate change. So for example, in one of our most recent meetings, we actually had a speaker come and talk about electronic vehicles. Oh, excuse me, yeah, so, so why did we do that? Well, because typically within communities of color, specifically black, indigenous, and people of color communities or what we call BIPOC communities, electronic vehicles, very similar to um, how my colleague spoke about farmers not wanting to do certain things within community colors, people feel like I'm barely just getting a car, let alone an electronic vehicle. That's something other than zero to one, like nothing or Tesla, there's nothing in between. And so what we understand is by providing that additional insight, after that meeting, we had several people say, you know what, I'll consider um, an EV. 
now that I have this additional information. So what am I talking about today? Well, let's take a breath. If you take a breath with me right now, what do we have in common? Every single person under my voice receives oxygen and produces CO2. The seemingly weakest part of us is the most important and efficient aspect of our collective humanity. Because even though we're in this video presentation mode right now, if any one of us on this call were to stop breathing, all else would stop. That we have in common, we are one human race with multiple shades and all kinds of combinations thereof. But at the end of the day, we are one human race. So let's look at what's happening as we seek balance. On the global front, according to an analysis presented by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the world is now adding more capacity for renewable power in 2013 than coal, natural gas, and oil combined. The world added 143 gigabytes of renewable electricity capacity compared to 141 gigawatts in new plants that burn fossil fuels. And this shift is, ex is expected to accelerate. At the federal level, energy efficiency, renewables, equity, and its impacts on the economy are being looked at in new ways. In the state of Ohio, well, many of us know that earlier this year, as a matter of fact, in July, the FBI launched an investigation into a corruption and bribery of HB6. This was a bill that was passed in 2019, and there are more than 61 million of alleged bribes and corruption connected to this. Now, some would say, oh my gosh, but we say in 2020, what an interesting year for this to come forward because it speaks to all the things that my colleagues have spoken to before. That even though at a global level, we're moving toward energy efficiency. And even though at the federal level, there's conversations within the state of Ohio, there was a need or a desire perhaps as alleged by the FBI to pay more than $61 million in bribes to do what? slow down this very thing that we are talking about. So as a result of that, we now have an opportunity to now come back to that table and perhaps as the constituents and as Ohioans bring forward a message that benefits our all, all of us. So specifically at the local level in Columbus right now, you have an issue on the ballot. Residents have an opportunity in November to vote for clean air, a healthy environment, and jobs and renewable energy. One of our colleagues and one of our allies, Power Clean Future Ohio, is a supporter of that and is driving and striving toward moving that forward. So as I close, just a couple of thoughts I would like to leave you with it and as you prepare your questions. One is decision point. Kirk Gibson sample writes that image times vividness equals reality. Our thoughts today determine tomorrow's reality. And our experience today is a result of yesterday's thoughts and decisions. So I'd like to leave you with this. I'm a Marvel fan. So here are a few words from the Marvel film, Black Panther, as spoken by Chadwick Boseman in his role as Ch King T'Challa son of King T'Chaka, the sovereign ruler of the nation of Wakanda. We can no longer do our work from the shadows of isolation. We cannot, we must not. We have an opportunity to be an example of how we as brothers and sisters on this earth should treat each other. Now more than ever, the illusions of division threaten our very existence. We all know the truth, more connects us than separates us. But in times of crisis, the wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. We must find a way 
to look after one another as if we were one single tribe. That concludes my statements for today for consideration. I appreciate your time, your attention, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Samia, and, and thanks to all the panelists. Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Wilson, and I'm an atmospheric research scientist at the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center um, and a climate specialist with OSU Extension. And it's certainly a pleasure to be a part of this panel today. Uh, thanks to Joe and, and EPN folks and, and certainly the wonderful presentation earlier uh, by Catherine Hayhoe. A little bit about my background, um, you know, the Bird Center obviously conducts extensive engagement in, in the realm of climate and climate change throughout campus, the state, uh, and the world, in addition to the wonderful climate scientists through a lot of dedicated scientists there uh, at the center. I've been lucky to be part of the education outreach effort for many years now, and then over the last four years, OSU, OSU Extension has really welcomed me as part of their family to make connections between climate science and in the agricultural community in Ohio and throughout the Midwest. And, you know, agriculture is such a key stakeholder in the state of Ohio. And this relationship with the agricultural community is really a found one of the foundations for uh, the state climate office as well, as we strive to meet the, the, the needs, the weather and climate needs of our community. You know, being asked to reflect a bit on today's um, uh, presentation and, and, and talk about climate change in Ohio, uh, I can't help but to think, you know, and start with the story. Uh, more, more than four years ago now, uh, when a former student uh, convinced a county commission in Western Ohio uh, to have me speak at their big annual breakfast. And moments after I entered the building, uh, one of the officials came up to me and, said, and asked, you're not going to be talking about global warming, are you? Now, of course, I, I had made no secret that I was there to talk about climate change and, and, and the impacts on agriculture, and I did so. Um, and, and I can't deny, even during the presentation, I, I had folks that were laughing, you know, specifically at the presentation. And, and, and sometimes when you're talking about climate change, it takes courage. We have to have the courage to, to keep doing so because talking about it is very important. And so I knew then I had to make those connections and, and change the presentation to be personal, get on the level with the farmers in terms of what they are actually experiencing where they live. And so when, when Catherine talks about things like togetherness and the emotional response and communication of why it matters and the positive things we can do about it. I think it's such an important message. Uh, we're all impacted by weather. So having a passion about weather is a connection that allows me uh, to talk, you know, very closely with the farmers, but, you know, all farmers are generally meteorologists at heart. And so that that's a, a connection there. But um, you know, making those connections through agricultural impacts and building dialogue together around steps to adapt and mitigate future changes. You know, we can make those personal connections even down to the county level where, where individual counties throughout Ohio have certain agricultural identities. Uh, from forestry to livestock to specialty crops. You want to talk about insects? Climate change lets us talk about insects. Let, let insects, let's let's exchange those ideas. You want to talk about soil health? Let's talk about the ways in which climate change impacts our soils. We're both experts, right? In our own right. Everyone is an expert in their own lives. So climate can be the bridge that allows us to share that expertise with one another. And it, it really encourages us to have empathy for others. You know, images of, of sea level rise uh, in, in, in island nations or the ice melting is very provocative, right? It's very, very vivid. It's visual. It's tangible. Uh, and that, but that also, you know, encourages us, implores us really to have empathy for what others are experiencing. And that's no different here in Ohio. What is a farmer experiencing with these changes and, and how does that then become part of the dialogue? And finally, just to end, you know, we, we think about trusted voices, our family being trusted voices. And as we, we get more polarization, you know, those trusted voices all of a sudden aren't as trusted. So putting attention to those trusted voices and in agriculture, you know, it comes down to fellow and, and neighbor farmers, our, our CCAs and, and, and extension and, and everyone, it takes that community as Samia was talking about. So trust is, is inherently built through shared experiences. So the more we share with one another, the more trust we can build. So I, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here and we'll take any questions that we have today. Thank you. 
All right, thank you all. Um, my first question that I want to ask builds on this theme of common ground. And when Dr. Hayhoe was presenting, she showed some research that 93% of the American population is not dismissive about climate change, about talking about climate change. So if you think about that 93%, and I want you to think about a specific stakeholder group that you've built a bridge with, or you've had a conversation, a productive conversation about climate change with. What was the initial starting point? How did you begin to find that common ground? Aaron, you just gave a great example. Maybe I'll kick it over to Troy or Samia or Fred to provide a tangible example that we can consider here in Ohio. Okay, so a tangible example. Um, I can speak to the allies, right? So within the environmental movement, when you think of an environmental organization, typically it is viewed as an organization that is white led and the majority of the participants um, are not people of color. And then um, when black environmental leaders started, we had organizations beginning to come to us and say, hey, um, we recognize that we need to diversify our staff. And so one of the things that we've done that has been very helpful is that we provide space to be uncomfortable, right? So in our world, we have the anticipation that we're also always supposed to feel good about everything. Well, some things that we're dealing with um, is not very comfortable and we have different feelings. And so what we've done is we've provided a table where people can come as their authentic selves because we believe you start with authenticity then you add congruency, do what you said you were gonna do. And if you can't say what that is, and then that allows that safe environment or that environment where you can have those conversations. And what you find out is you have more in common than you really realized you did. And then from there, it becomes uh, its own um, energy and its own actions. All right. Um, so for me personally, um, so I joined the undergraduate student government um, at my second year at Ohio State. I'm currently a fourth year. Um, and so I joined undergraduate student government because I wanted to engage with those students who um, weren't necessarily aware of the importance of climate change. Um, I think for the most part, young people and students at Ohio State are aware of the importance of climate change, but it's about finding those pathways in which they can engage with actions on campus. And so I think the undergraduate student government does a really good job. We're a pretty large student organization. And so we do a really good job of reaching out to various student organizations. And we're provided with so many pathways in which we can engage with other people. And I'm also an RA. And so I live in a building with over a thousand people. And so it's having those conversations on a meaningful level and engage and creating those spaces where you can engage and have open dialogue. And that's what's really been beneficial for students on campus is not only having those conversations, but then advocating for those students and creating actions in which they can physically engage with on-campus sustainability to mitigate climate change. You know, I got involved with uh climate change clear back uh, maybe 12 years ago with cap and trade when we thought that was going to happen with Waxton Markey. I was convinced that there was a pony in that pile of manure somewhere and we just had to figure out how to do it. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't go uh, any, any, further, any further than the house that time, but uh, we got a lot of uh, pushback from uh, some farm groups with uh, cow taxes and things like that. But the point is that you really have to understand my, my talk with farmers is that we can be the solution. I think agriculture can be a bigger solution to climate change than any other industry that's in, in the world today. And I think that we just have to figure out ways to, to you figure out the metrics we can use and also figure out ways that, that we can be compensated for this in a, in a way that doesn't use the value all up in, in the measuring system. So I really do believe that uh, once we figure this out, farmers can be the, the, the a huge part of the, of the solutions for climate change. We just have to have, figure out how to do it. And I just, I'm anxious to make sure that farmers have the opportunity and also the willingness to do it. I'm gonna uh, ask a question to the full panel and it's from the Q and A box. What encouraged your exploration of climate resiliency and mitigation? And what advice do you have for students or early career folks who want to be proactive about solving climate change? 
what encouraged your exploration of climate resiliency or mitigation, and what advice do you have for students or early career folks who want to be proactive about solving climate change? Well, I'll just say that I think the important thing is to uh, be non-combative when you talk about it. And we've already been advised that this morning. And I think that's really important. If you come along and, and seem to be smug that you are knowing more than what somebody else is, it's, it's not going to go over very well. So I think you talk in, in just common sense uh, prerogatives. I mean, on the farm, like I said, you know, farmers will definitely talk about the weather pattern changes, but they don't believe in climate change. Well, you know, if it's kind of one of the same, then just go along with the dialogue. In other words, get them to at least talk about it, whether it's in, in, in small bites or whatever. But uh, the nice thing about Ohio is, is the fact that we have some water quality issues that we're having, having to address here as farmers. But the neat thing about it is it's, it's a systems approach rather than just a, a silver a bullet. I mean, there's no silver bullet to solve this, but there's lots of silver buckshot. And that's really what we have to do is put a system together where many, many things put together is going to make a difference, not only in water quality, but also climate. But again, let's take the, the scary stuff away and let's show farmer that he can actually have an economic gain by doing the right thing. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback off of what Fred said. I think, you know, as, as Catherine pointed out in her presentation, you know, once you realize that the climate science in and of itself, while to a scientist like myself is very powerful, it's not getting the message across without having dialogue built around the solutions. And so that's, you know, I, I uh, you know, I don't know the exact moment, but eventually, you know, you come to the realization that, um, and, and just through own personal optimism that, that we can make changes that have great benefits to avoiding even worse outcomes in the future. And so that's an important piece to, st to start with. You know, as a student, I, you do not have to throw a stone anywhere you know, or very far on campus to find a group uh, whose work can be associated with climate and climate change. And so I, I would encourage you to, you know, as you explore your own interests, uh, certainly uh, reaching out to, to those groups on campus or elsewhere, there are plenty of opportunities, I think, uh, for those to, to make those opportunities with universities all across the world, advocacy groups, um, and, and, and the like, there are plenty of resources out there to get started. So that's what I would encourage. Thanks, Fred and Aaron. I'd also like to chime in and say for me, what encouraged my exploration was, um, it was cultural. It's always been a part of my family's understanding that we are one with nature and nature is one with us. So it would only just continue to grow that climate would also be a part of that as we notice the changes that are happening within our everyday life. Um, as a student, the advice that I would give is I would say, remember that there are many voices, but we have one purpose. And, and to that point is um, doing your research, not only on the climate change and the climate and science, but also looking at the contributions of all peoples to this work, um, that there are folks for generations. Um, you think about specifically, I'll speak about just really briefly from a slavery perspective. One of the reasons that slavery happened was that it was an economic construct. And so with that came um, bringing people of color because they had the ability to work the land and to grow things, right? So it started as far as before then. Likewise with our indigenous brothers and sisters, similar that as those who came here to the United States, it was the indigenous people that helped to show them how to work the land to so that they could actually survive. And so I know it happened a long time ago, However, those roots come all the way up to today. And it's important to remember when you're speaking with communities, even though you have really great information, there's also a lot of great information that those communities can share with you. So uh, I think it was Fred that said, you know, remember when you're talking to people that they know some things too. So make sure that there's space for that information to come forward as well. And then one quick thing I wanted to mention so we can get on to the next question is that as a student personally, the ways I have engaged is just by simply putting myself out there, looking for those resources, looking for those people. And then also like um, Samia mentioned, like talking about intersectionality of like issues and stuff like that. Um, so as a student, um, reach out to student orgs, um, reach out to faculty and staff where you have those common interests and form those relationships so that you can move forward and actively pursue um, positions in mitigating climate change.
Great, thank you. And I think we have time for maybe one or two uh, panelists to answer this question. Right now, what do you prioritize? What should, what do you advise those on the call now to focus on policy-wise to tackling climate change? Well, I would think I would, I would focus on policy, uh, policy that gives a, a chance for uh, somebody to try new things. Maybe it's like a safe harbor provision where I don't think there's uh, any doubt that there's other things out there that we haven't even discovered yet. But unfortunately, we, when we have our agriculture policies, especially in DC with the farm bill, some things are, are kept from doing because you're, it'll throw you out of another program. So, so you gotta be really careful. We had that happen with just a couple years ago with uh, cover crops and, and crop insurance. Uh, the farmers were being penalized uh, by, by putting cr uh, cover crops out and they were getting thrown out for their, their original um, crop that they were insuring. So again, that it's, we have to have some sort of enabling policy put in place that, that give farmers the chance to discover this stuff. Unfortunately, there's not really a lot of uh, land grant universities that are working on cover crops and no-till and, and, and conservation things. And I think that it's coming from the private sector. I, I've encouraged uh, OSU Extension uh, emphatically to be more involved in, in coming up with the technology that we need for, uh, for implementing these practices. Every farmer will do it if they have the confidence to do it. But that's just, it. Let's, let's come up with some enabling policy that, that all farmers can embrace. Great, thank you, Fred. And on that topic, I do wanna to point you to some of the resources that uh, Catherine has posted, a few others have posted in there related to farmers and climate change and climate solutions. Um, Samia, uh, Aaron, Troy, do you have a final response about what, to, what you're focusing on right now? Sure, um, I'm focusing on um, working with multiple coalitions that represent a bright swath of all persons um, that leans toward transparency, accountability, equity, and zero carbon. I think for students, the biggest barrier to um, discussing issues with climate change is accessibility. And so for the undergraduate student government and student organizations on, camp on campus, I think our main goal is making those resources accessible to students um, so that they can feel that they're being um, a member of the movement and actually doing something for climate change. Yeah, and I, I think the space, you know, from a, a research standpoint is really on the integration of climate science with the social sciences, with the economic modeling, the ecosystem services. We're doing a lot of that work, uh, coupling with Sustainability Institute and others on campus to work uh, toward, you know, offering or, or finding out what those solutions could be in that coexistence space. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for all those responses and for being so quick and adaptive here for what can be sometimes a confusing uh, online format. So wonderful. Um, Aaron, Samia, Fred, Troy, thank you so much. Um, I do want to, uh, as part of the EPN, as our tradition, um, Dr. Hayhoe received one earlier and now to you four, um, sort of our, our thank you, our online certificate um, to acknowledge your participation. Um, be wonderful. We we're all in the same person. We could hand you something. But um, anyway, um, great to see you all on the screens. Um, so much to think about. And, and thank you to everyone who's asked questions. I do want to point you towards if you um, have been looking at the Q&A and you click on the answered options, you'll see um, all of our panelists so far, including Dr. Ayo, have responded to questions in there. So keep following that. That's going to be open for the rest of the session today. Um, we will be returning again in about um, eight minutes. So we're going to take a quick break. Um, and Dr. Hayhoe will be back to present um, on how we can address the main challenges and opportunities to incorporating historic and past climate information into practical on the ground planning um, for understanding what future climate scenarios will be like at local and regional scales. So that'll be at, in the hour starting at noon. And then we'll have this incredible um, Ohio State uh, science panel who will be discussing the key themes of that and how it relates to their own work. And Dr. Matt Pertola will be moderating that. So um, please stick with us. Um, we will be back again at noon um, for Dr. Hayhoe's second talk. And thank you again um, to all of our panelists uh, for being part of um, this, that first session we just had.